we have been raising healers and miracle workers. And although I know Jesus Christ personally, we hold that in spirit there is no denomination. In fact, my cousin, St. Dorothy Karen, who was raised from the dead, I'll tell you more about that story, back in 1930s, her words were, although I consider myself Anglican, in healing there is no denomination, for spirit is one. We say that in spirit, there is de no denomination. We echo St. Dorothy Karen's words there. And we say that all spiritual languages hold the inherent possibility of ascension, which we say is the natural unfolding of your life, the illumination of your consciousness, and a deepening intimacy with God. So what you're here to experience today is a powerful transmission designed for spiritual renewal and refreshment. It's a freedom from the ties that bind and it's a deep, deep healing. You see, deliverance is a transmission. It's a mechanism. It's a dynamic process that liberates and restores. And it liberates and restores as a mechanism of the universe, no matter who you are or how far you've traveled on your spiritual mastery. And that mechanism is shared between us by participation and transmission. Much like energy transference, which we've known about for 4,000 years, if you put an ice cube and a hot coal next to each other, there is a transmission that occurs and the frequencies meld. It's like a flame to a flame. If you received your preparation email from me, then you read that beautiful poem by Simeon, the new theologian, where he says that what I have seen is the totality recapitulated as one, received not in essence, but by participation, like a flame to a flame. It is the whole flame that you receive. You can imagine two candles next to each other where one candle is a flame and the other candle has a wick that is cold and black. And when you put those two together, a flame to a flame with no diminishment from the first. So enlightenment and spiritual liberation and deliverance is a universal dynamic process that works regardless of who you are and how far you feel you've come or haven't come. And it's our participation with one another that allows that transmission. So the vehicle that I'm using to deliver this vibration, to deliver this healing is spoken word ascension teachings and true stories. In other words, the deliverance is literally embedded, infused, if you will, in the words that travel like a flame to a flame across time and space between us. The spirit that unifies us, that's why prayer works, that's why remote healing works. And that's why the transmission of deliverance works, even by spoken word across space and time. The method that you are gonna use, so that's the method that I'm using to deliver. The method you're using to receive is a state of relaxed allowing. I'm gonna tell you this up front. The Sovereign Way teachings are extremely rich 
and they carry an exceptionally high vibration. This is Holy Spirit transmission. So if you approach this event as an intellectual exercise, you're gonna find yourself standing at an enormous luxury buffet, completely overwhelmed, trying to consume it all, trying to eat it all up. Instead, approach our time together as if you were attending a spa for the soul and simply be willing to receive. And the sovereign way will deliver what you need in the way that you need it, because the Holy Spirit works from within. Just allow revelation, allow discovery, and leave all your judgments at the door. It's okay if you're triggered by certain words or certain ideas, that's all right. That's just biology, also a mechanism. But let yourself simply notice what's occurring and suspend your disbelief. This is poise. The word poise is important in the sovereign way because it's literally disengaging the gears and allowing something new to come to form. You might have your favorite pen and some good paper with you to write on, that's all right, but only take note of your own revelations and your own discoveries as they come up. Don't try to write everything down. Don't try to write down what's being taught, because if you do, your consciousness will return to intellectual processing as opposed to spiritual participation. And remember, it's by, by participation that the essence is received and the flame is lit. Don't worry, you'll receive this, this um, replay later on. You're gonna hear from a few guest speakers, speakers who have experienced the results firsthand. It always helps to share stories and to share true stories. That's, that's how we engage. God is inherently relational, which means it's, it's, it's in our sharing that we grow. And we're also going to take a few short spaces in between the teachings to just breathe and process. So most importantly, the most important thing for your success today is to just relax into your seat and let this time be a gift to yourself and a reward for being so wonderfully made, for walking so steadfastly through a life that hasn't been easy. Let yourself be seen and acknowledged for how far you've come, how wonderfully you've become through your hardship. To acknowledge for yourself how your legacy even now is deepening and impacting the world, whether you can see the effects of that or not. And let our time together also be an activation let it be an agreement together with everybody, everyone on this call. Let us all come together in agreement that what we're bringing forth here is the next great up level in our life. So take a moment now, if you're on Zoom, take a moment to scroll through the other members and make eye contact with one another see each other, share a smile. I see Grace, hello. And Grace's guest. I see Joni, I see Valerie. I see Holly. I see Joe. I see Shelley. And Joyce and Alan, I see you. I see your wedding photo. I see Mary, welcome. Welcome, Mary. I see Maria, thank you for being here. And Matt, I see Sava, darling, thank you for being here. And Kat. And Tina, I see Samantha. Hello, Samantha. 
And hello, Ali. Michael, good to see you, sir. John, Vonda, Mariah, and Lynn. See, God is inherently relational. Source is inherently relational. It says at the very beginning of, of Matthew, right in the beginning that John, excuse me, the book of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So the spirit of the transmission is with source, which means with that inherently implies relationality, which means that in our togetherness, in our participation with one another, we have a phenomenally and exponentially powerful enhancement of our shared intention. So that's why we're in agreement together. We're allowing today to be the activation of that agreement. Are you ready? Are you? <laughs> then let us begin. You are here because you want to transform in some way. That's what deliverance is about. It's about being delivered from one reality into another. And deliverance inherently also implies that there is a mechanism going on outside of your efforting. That there is the essence of salvation. That for all your mastery and for all your power and for all your spiritual authority and for all your independence, and for the amazing way in which you've taken accountability and responsibility for your life, you're still allowed to be delivered. There's something very beautiful and, and intimate and liberating about deliverance. So you're here because you want to, to want to transform. That's the goal. That's why you're here. You're not here to fact find. And that's good because I'm not going to tell you anything new really, because everything that I'm going to tell you is already written on your heart. It's already coded into your DNA. You don't want to collect more dots that you need to join later on. You're here to become. And that always means a deeper intimacy with who you are and how you move in our beautiful shared world and how you extend your treasure, your gift, your magic, in a way that leaves a mark and makes the world a better place. So that means that right now, where you are, all your brilliant experience and all your clever, clever knowledge needs to be lovingly put into neutral, and placed in a tender and poised spot in your psyche. Because this class is brand new and who you are right now in this container is brand new and needs to be open to hearing in a new way. So now make agreement, drop yes, into the message box, into the chat box, if you make agreement that you are now willing to hear in a new way, to receive something brand new, to discover something completely unknown by you. Pop it in the chat, good. Yes, please. Yes. 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 Yes, we agree. And we've come together in that agreement. So that is what we're doing. We're going through the veil together. So become comfortable. Become comfortable. Do you like that way of saying it? Instead of get comfortable or make yourself comfortable, become comfortable. Become poised in the body. Become poised in your vibration. Become poised in mind. 
Release the tension in your scalp and your eyebrows, just soften. Release the tension in the fold between your nose and your mouth. Let your neck and shoulders release. Let your spine align. Let your lovely bottom sink into your seat. Let your belly soften, your lovely belly. And let the feelings and the emotions from the day just dissolve like mist at dawn, released easily into the ether. Let your thoughts of doubt and skepticism, judgment, criticism and fear disengage and archived back into the infinite mind of quantum cognition. They're always there. They don't need to be active. You are here. You are free. And you are sovereign. What I'm sharing with you today is a true story about how my family was delivered from our worst nightmare. It's a story of radical faith. And even though the happenings that I'm going to describe were unique to us, the hardship is universal. And it's immediately relevant to you and to your life. Wherever you find yourself, however ascended or conscious or spiritually mature, that you consider yourself to be. The mechanism of hardship and deliverance is timeless. So this true story is my account of a path that leads from desolation to salvation, from constant death and rebirth to eternal life, and from the thickets of a smelly putrid bog heaving with the aroma of a skunk's final defense against a vicious fox that actually happened underneath my house at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning, shortly after we'd been saved from a derelict barn. And all the way from that putrid skunk stench to the scintillating lightness and clarity of fresh grace when the rainbows burst from the prisons hanging in my windows right over there in my kitchen. Now, of course, the whole absolute truth is much, much vaster than what I can share. Infinitely so, in fact. And it's much simpler than I can share too. That's the mystery. But my offering to you today and the vehicle of this transmission is the truth as I know it, having been the hero on the journey for a little while. I can tell you that it's messier than I thought it would be when I dreamed about it when I was a little girl, when I was promising God that I would be good over and over again as I grew up, long before I descended into the filth of my darkening consciousness, perhaps to see if I could overcome the foulest of beasts as I engaged for two decades with binge drinking, promiscuity, profound anxiety and shame and extreme poverty. I can also tell you this, that it's safe to be delivered home. It's safe not to be the one who has to fix your life. You know, we awaken, we say, oh, I'm no longer stuck in the system. And then we consider ourselves sovereign in our own right. And we say, I'm no longer waiting for someone to save me. I'm ready, I'm ready to take on accountability for my own life and my own experience. And that is very noble. But on that journey, that journey of awakened conscious participation with your enlightenment that you've been walking for a while, you're not new to this stuff. On that journey, there comes a point where your magnetism is strong and effective and it's magnifying your experience of what you don't want. That's why they say the path gets narrower and a slight step out of alignment has devastating effects. In fact, this is the single most important thing that you need to know. 
to undertake the nerve wracking perilous journey of ascending consciousness on your own authority in an environment of immediate energetic turbulence in these unprecedented times of spiritual warfare is madness. That's insanity. Know this though, it's safe to trust the inner agency that's calling you into being. And there is no dishonor in being saved nanosecond by nanosecond from the systems that enslave you. You see, there is a grace that has been dispensed into the collective, into the quantum field. And that grace is as subtle and universal as quantum physics, and it's as illogical and mystical too. It defies even nature's laws, at least those that can be measured on the surface. And the embodiment of this grace is the lifting of weight, like an elevation from the immense crushing pressure at the bottom of the deep sea, to the breaking of the surface and bursting with a gasp of air into the light. It's a lightening, it's enlightenment. Cast your burdens upon me for my yoke is light. Now my personal goal in sharing this story is for the transmission of knowing to serve as a buoyancy device so that you can enjoy the life-saving sensation, the life-changing sensation of grace as it fills you up from the inside. So you have permission to stop striving. So you have the embodied trust to simply allow that natural ascension to simply allow the restoration of the things in your life that would be healed. Life is full of magic and miracle. And yes, some horrible smelly dragons that must be slayed on the way and some unexpected canyons to traverse, vast and deep caverns to get lost in, questionable rope bridges to cross and the unveiling of villains that you thought were friends and friends that you thought were villains. And there are treasures, richer and more marvelous for every step as you learn how to notice them. And at the end, spoiler alert, the crown is rightfully restored and you can experience the world as the one that you came here to be. So before I launch into my account of what happened, I'm gonna draw a couple of models. These are two dimensional representations of something quantum. They're not supposed to show you the whole truth. They're supposed to help us arrange our thinking and there'll be useful reference points throughout our time together. And if you want to draw along in your notepad, that's okay, but make sure that you're following because grasping this is more important than the pretty images. And I'll do my best to make them pretty. And I will send you the copies along with the replay afterwards. So check this out. There are three elements in the universe, only three. There is source, which is love, formless, endless, ineffable seed of consciousness, all knowing, beginning, father. And there is spirit, the unifying field of motion, movement, relation. It's love in action, it's God in action, it's the indwelling power. And there is substance, which is form, time, space, energy. 
So we have source, we have spirit, and we have substance. We have isness, we have stuff, and we have movement. We have Father, we have Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. We have Creator, created, and the infinite love between us all. So God is these things at once, distinct, yet indivisible. So this is what all things are, because God is all there is. Let's look at stuff for a moment. It's important to dwell on that just for a little bit. This is the primordial place where God becomes manifest, where God becomes actual, where form occurs. This is reality. This is reality. These are all the elements of particularized reality, of particle. So differences of potential and separate configurations are made possible here. So like a nice camembert cheese is different from your neon light bulbs, which are different from the ponderosa pine trees of the Rocky Mountains. And all that difference is possible because of configurations of particle. There's a very real difference between Grace and Valerie and Joe and Shelley. Particularized reality. So this element of God, substance, is manifest as arrangements of particles. And particles of infinity are known as adamantine particles. Adamant means firm. Adam is first. The first manifestations of God. And the adamantine particles are literally the body of God, for they bring divine will into manifestation. This is how divine mind becomes form. So the configuration here is quite important. The arrangement is important. Consciousness knows shape, right? We create as we believe. So it is our consciousness that knows shape. And it is spirit that moves shape. Spirit is, the, is, is love in motion. It's knowing in motion. So spirit is the power that moves. An adamantine particle substance make up shape. So don't be afraid of structure, right? All things that are in, in substance are structure and don't be afraid of structure. Just know what it is and understand that structure is mortal. So it has no command over your life. Anything that is particularized has zero command. It does attempt to control by force but true authority comes from loving command of the power to move. Essence is immortal. That's where true command comes from. Now, when my family became homeless, when I had to move my children age six and two into a derelict barn because everything we had created Everything that we had created by force out there in the world of structure fell apart in a radical, quick way. And I had to move my little babies into a derelict barn and we had to tie the, the barn doors together with a bungee cope to prevent the bears from being able to get in, the bears that would scavenge the, the trash pile outside. We learned very quickly that without the structure of a house, we needed to tap into the essence of home. So we needed to know the difference between home and house. We needed to know the difference between the infinite essence of something and the structure that we create. 
So when there was no structure for us to have a house, to, to have a home inside, we still had home. We hung up fairy lights and we sat on cushions and we meditated together and we diffused essential oils together and we played Scrabble by fairy light and we nurtured the essence of home. And by focusing on home, which is an immortal essence, house was able to come to form quickly. House, a structure in which essence can abide. We were in that barn for 10 weeks, nurturing the essence of home. When out of the blue, just like that, while I was teaching a class on mysticism at a local Episcopal church, someone raised their hand and said, would you mind staying in our cabin for a whole year to make sure that the pipes don't freeze while I go to Manhattan for the winter? So the next thing we know, now we have a house, not just any house, but a house that is worthy of the essence of home that we've been upholding. House is a structure. Home is an essence. So you are all these three things. You are a totality of three recapitulated as one. And the extent to which you embody this love, embody this knowing, that's your log of consciousness. And your log of consciousness dictates the power of your magnetism and the power of your spiritual authority. More on that later. Here's the second form I wish to show you. So let's look again at this. So, all things are this trinity. God is all things. Because in the beginning, there was only God. There was the word, which is spirit, which is movement, which is, which is knowing in action. And it was with God. So this, this inherent relationality is what all things are. And I will represent that on this page as a field up here. And I will call it God. Now, in your spiritual language, perhaps you call it something else. Perhaps you call it source. Maybe you call it universe. Maybe you call it infinite cosmic creatrix. It's the same thing. It truly is the same thing because there are only three elements in the universe. So God is real. It is that trinity of source, spirit, and substance. It is all actualized creation. It is knowing It is love and its true nature is a mystery. And I'm gonna show that the, in, that, that the human being, you, are an individuation of that totality, just like a strand of that essence is drawn out. And remember I said that spirit is power? Well, guess what? It's the power to create and it is infinitely creative. So all possibilities are held in this quantum uh, field of creation. So you are the spirit of source manifested as substance. And the human consciousness affects that creative spirit, that creative reality, the same way that a prism affects light, by taking superstate potentiality and splitting it into possibility, and then perceiving that possibility and experiencing it as manifest life. So here's manifest life right here. So this is spirit, this is essence, this is your consciousness, this is that that the, the essence of spirit creating through your consciousness, becoming your energy. This is your thought wave, your heart wave, your electromagnetic output. And this is your life arranging itself according to that energy, the energy which is impacted by your consciousness. So for example, even though all things are possible in God, Right? We, make it, we make agreement that all things are possible in God. Yes? Do we make agreement? Are we agreeing on that? Put yes in the comments. 
who believes that all things are possible in God? Pop it down. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's how they say it in, in America. Yep. Valerie says, I know it. Yes. By the way, we have some people from all over the world. We have Sweden representing. We have Portugal representing. We have Britain representing. We have America representing. I am so proud and honored to have the whole world representing in the agreement that we believe that all things are possible in God. And yet, we'll make agreement with only certain things. We'll make agreement with nobody understands me. Religion is dangerous. Magic is evil. Medicine is bad. Democrats are bad. Republicans are bad. I'm not worthy to receive. Grace is real for others, but not for me. Black lives matter less than white lives. There's no such thing as aliens, right? It sounds silly, but isn't that a creative declaration? How about I'm going to get cancer? How about there's no meaning to anything and I'm all on my own? How about I only attract abusers? Or I, I can be betrayed and I will be betrayed. Or I have to do it all on my own. Or if I didn't work for it, then I don't really deserve it. You get the idea, right? Super state reality, all things possible in God, refracted, split, all potentiality split into possibility by our agreement and then refracted as our energetic stamp into life, which arranges itself because guess what? Adamantine particles are commanded by the creative spirit that is commanded by consciousness. I know you already know this. I'm just arranging it. Where are you denying the possibility of God's awesome power in your life? Are you brave enough to know? Where are you in cultural or genetic agreement with something less than your true call? So even though we agree that all things are possible in God, which is biblical, Matthew 19, 26, our denial of possibilities and agreement with limitation is what creates the coordinates of consciousness that shapes our experience. Wonderful reflection there in the chat. Yes. Now, the human experience is an interconnected system of consciousness, right? The essence that moves through the consciousness, the energy as a result of the, the, the spirit taking the shape of consciousness and the third dimensional manifestation. So your experiences is an interconnected system of that. And your third dimensional manifestation in your life is always a vibrational causal response to that interconnected system. So what you experience is determined by what you know. So for example, here comes a trigger, right? You've decided that men are liars and that, let's say for, let's say this is, I'm gonna use a true example from my life. Let's say that someone 
in ninth grade betrayed you and he was wearing acts for men at the time? Yes. A false limbic association is made between the, the essence of acts for men and the experience of being betrayed. So even though this man is no longer anywhere near the life, here comes a chap, poor old chap. He's in Walmart buying his bananas. He has no idea what you went through in, in ninth grade, but guess what? He's wearing acts for men. And you're standing there in line next to this man with his bananas and his pungent acts for men. And even though you haven't quite clocked it yet, there's a, some, a, a subtle limbic association that's occurring because your energy field is prehending and perceiving that impulse that is coded in your consciousness, in your subconsciousness as a trigger for betrayal. So now, there is a rise of emotion. That is a biological animal response. It's got nothing to do with spirit. It's got nothing to do with your spiritual maturity. It's got nothing to do with your intelligence. That is the animal in you letting you know that there is danger nearby. And so your vibration shifts, your emotional vibration shifts, and your whole limbic system goes danger, danger, danger. You're in the presence of betrayal. And even though you haven't actually smelt the axe for men yet, now you're in the presence of betrayal, which means that your mind, right? Because your, 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 your body chemistry has changed now because you've gone into parasympathetic mode. So now your body has dumped a whole load of adrenaline and cortisol into your system. So your body chemistry is off. Thoughts are not linear, by the way. Thoughts are quantum which means you can only access the thoughts that you're in a vibrational resonance with. So now your body has gone into some sort of strange mode and your mind, your, your, your mental narrative is now putting linear words to that experience, searching around for reasons for why you believe this, for why you're feeling this way. I'm feeling angry now. It's because of this, this isn't a very good deal. I came into Walmart to get oranges and all I got is mandarins. I can't believe it. And you put these linear words to make sense of what you're experiencing. So your emotional world has now created a new mental world. So you've got different thoughts going on and these thoughts create feelings. Feelings and emotions are different. Emotions are biological responses to external stimuli and feelings are internal responses to a spiritual process. So now you feel differently and what do you do? You behave differently. You're snapping at the checkout girl. You go home and have, you exchange words or you don't answer the email or you don't pick up the phone or you fail to complete on something that you need to complete on because you're feeling differently. So this is how we get stuck in that interconnected system of recreating what we already know. That's why we need deliverance. Now with the sovereign lens, with the sovereign way, we can easily see what the links are between form, vibration and consciousness. For the last two years, I've been working with this modality in a clinical capacity as a part of a medical team. And I've witnessed incredible transformations from disease and despair to healing and growth. I've also seen how it works as a coaching model, guiding the seeker from tangle to resolution and empowering mastery for any circumstance. And because of the power of, of this work, my husband and I have decided to shift our delivery from clinic and coaching to ministry, because this is God's stuff. This belongs to spirit and it needs, it needs to travel. Because you see, it is possible to dissolve the links between trigger, emotion, feeling and behavior. Are there any Reiki masters on the call? Click the raise hand icon. If you're a Reiki master, 
or a Reiki practitioner. Good, good. We have at least three. No, we have many more actually. Click the, click the little icon. Many, thank you for being here. I honor the craft. Now, Reiki practitioners, I'm gonna call you out, put you on the spot. And everybody else, what I want you to do is to conjure up, actually everyone on the call, conjure up in your mind the pattern, no matter how subtle, that you've been consistently creating in your life that is less than your potential. You already know what it is. Now you don't actually need to know the exact configuration in the subconscious mind that keeps this reality recreating. It would be impossible for us to try and, and unravel all those, all those limbic associations, all that acts for men incidents that, that have us recreating these things. You don't have to know all of that stuff. And we can spend eons in the drudgery of shadow work, trying to figure it all out, healing all ancestral wounds and karmic contracts. Just know the effects. And right now, while we're doing this together, place that knowing into this container. In your mind, just imagine that you're putting it right here where we are all sharing in agreement that all things are possible in God. And if you're a Reiki master right now, I want you to direct Honsha Zeshonen beyond space and time into the links that bind form, conscious, form, vibration and consciousness. And if you're not a Reiki practitioner, that's perfectly fine too. I want you to put your hands together and to say, yes, I agree in the dissolving and deliverance from these links, from the ties that bind us to this system and say that this is made true right now underneath the promise of the omnipresent possibility for complete renewal. And say, Amen. Yes, put Amen in the chat. Thank you Reiki masters for your help. I would like to invite eight of the men. <laughs> Grace, you crack me up. I would like to invite uh, a friend onto the call right now. I would like to invite Kat. Let me see, have I got Kat? I would like to invite Kat Lieberkin. She is an astonishing human being, an amazing presence. She has worked as a Hollywood makeup artist in LA. She's worked as uh, as uh, as a, uh, I want to say coach, but that's not the word. She's worked as a driver. She's worked in so many different capacities, and she's witnessed so many different energy fields and different kinds of people. And she's been studying the sovereign way for a year now, and actually recently said yes to supporting the growth of this ministry. And so I'd like to invite Kat to come on and just share some thoughts. To, to would you take the floor? Uh, please, Kat, and share some of your experiences since discovering Sovereign. I'm going to hand over to you now. Do I have Kat? Yes. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for your, your introduction. I definitely... Um, I, like you said, I've, I've had a, a pretty um, interesting journey, pushing boundaries and, and uh, wanting to definitely embrace gifts and, and push limits to what the, the beliefs were in, in where, where I, I, I came from, um, a small city in Denmark where moving to Hollywood and pursuing a career 
in makeup was not the norm and the mindset was definitely uh, not that that was possible. And, and yet before I, I, I encountered Sovereign, um, that was my, my journey that I was on for so many years. And um, obviously that's, that's led to, like we all encounter all these, these obstacles and, and bumps on the roads and, and ways that we were forced to grow and, um, and set bags and all these devastating losses and all these, all these, these ways and, and, and curves that the, the road's taking us. And um, I don't have a, a spiritual background and encountering Sovereign was, was a, 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 something that was quite unexpected, just kind of came across the, the journey I, I was on. I had already explored all these other different tools to try to handle setbacks and, and disappointments. And um, I found myself often, you know, either spending my time ruminating about things that had already happened that was, I was, I was, uh, I was uh, upset about or worrying about something that I wanted to avoid happening in the future. So um, I had a, a, an experience of not so much like, like, like uh, Elizabeth sharing like this hardship of homelessness, but it was more this like internal journey of, of struggling with where, what my path was, because it wasn't the beaten path. And I didn't have a, a, a sort of a, a laid out uh, map for me to travel. And I, I, I can say I've, I've really, uh, research all these different meditation tools and all these different spiritual groups and different belief systems and when I encountered um, the sovereign way the first thing that really hit me was how it just made logical sense I didn't it didn't fight any of the other belief systems that I'd studied or any other tools that I'd learned but um it just, I, did, I didn't have to fight it. I didn't have that resistance. And um, there's, a, there's a, I think I'm gonna paraphrase as a quote from Einstein about like, when you have an obstacle that occurs in your life, it's, it happens on one level. And in order to find the solution for it, you have to elevate to a different level where you can have a, a, a better perspective and a clear view. And that's, how I see sovereign because um, it's a direct it is a direct tool it's like you, it's not like there's a like Elizabeth mentioned it, those teachings are really rich but I in the beginning I, I found myself feeling like I, I went straight from middle school to like advanced class and really felt like I I, I was so happy knowing that I, I had a recording that I could watch again, but um, I, I felt like I really wanted to like force myself to a, this really ambitious idea that I, I was gonna really learn all this by heart, but I found it's just kind of over time programmed in and I can feel that by when I watch the teachings now, it, I don't feel as, as a almost exhausted by trying to absorb, but it just, it makes complete sense. And, and I can also find it in, um, I don't just use the sovereign way for when I encounter obstacles and, and, and things that, that feels like resistance. In fact, I feel a lot of less of that in my life now from having been following the, the sovereign way. I I think we lost Kat there for a moment. If you come back, Kat, just raise your hand up. I just want to say, if you don't return, ah, oh, here you are. Thank you. Oh, oh, am I back? Good, good, good. Um, what, what can you say? What, what I was saying when you lost me, or should I just go back a little bit? Yes. 
and that that sovereign is not just useful in moments of hardship and obstacle because you found that that as sovereign has become more embodied and active in your knowing um, that there's less of those anyway so will you pick up from there right 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 so um I, I find that um, because I've studied these teachings, my life na naturally flows a bit easier because I'm becoming more in touch with my natural gifts. I'm becoming more in touch with my authentic values and, and what, what is, is aligned with me. And that's really helped because in it, my, my, like you said, my mindsets absorbed the, the knowing of who I am, the knowing that um, all is possible in God. And it's, it's giving me the extra faith that I need in those moments that normally would feel like okay now I need to meditate or now I need to to really take one of the tools out of the box and call a friend or walk in nature or all these other things that are all really helpful as well but on top of that now in the back of my mind is the knowing and that's it's it's uh it's helping me embrace my my authentic self and my gifts and and also I find such joy in being able to um, bring that perspective into conversations with others as well, in the group and in my life outside. Wow, thank you so much, Kat. But when something is in your knowing, there it is, right there. And it's an adopted knowing, which means it's, the, it's become the coordinates through which you perceive and experience life. So although sovereign feels very rich and very meaty, it's wonderful what you said in the beginning there, Kat, about how it felt like you'd gone from second grade to advanced teachings. I know, I know what you mean. I mean, life is a little bit like that sometimes as well. You know, when we, were, when we were thrust into homelessness and you're sort of realizing that right now in the moment, I'm gonna to have to employ everything that I know about grace. And, and what is that again? But when it becomes embodied through, through contemplation, through reflection, but most importantly, through agreement, then it becomes the coordinates through which that essence creates your life. And so that's how sovereign becomes such an important lens. And Kat, I love that you said that even though you hadn't had those, those very um, structural hardship that can be, you know, can be likened to something like homelessness or you know, maybe alcoholism or disease or whatever else, but that hardship is unique to each person, but none of us walks without it. And so we aren't free from hardship, no matter what the story is. And it's important that we don't actually become too identified with that hardship or believe that our hardship is harder than other people's hardship. Either way, with that sovereign lens, as you've so beautifully described, Kat, it sort of aligns all things in life and, and allows the outpouring of your creative essence to command those adamantine particles in a completely different way. Thank you so much for contributing, Kat. I really appreciate that. If you enjoyed what Kat had to share, will you put just a, a heart emoji or something in the, in the chat and just send us some love? Because it, is, it always takes a bit of courage and effort to, to be seen. So I appreciate that very, very much. Spiritual healing is real. Oh, look at the chat filling up with love right there. Look at that, <laughs> you are loved. Spiritual healing is real. We've seen it working time and time again. Now, my cousin is, is Saint Dorothy Karen. She's an Anglican saint who in the 1930s died from tuberculosis, aged 18. And she came back to life after eight minutes of being pronounced dead in the witness of multiple doctors and priests who testified later and published research on the phenomenon. You can look her up 
Matt, would you type St. Dorothy Karen into the chat? And if you want to look her up, just copy and paste that later on. There are multiple um, research publications, multiple books written about the phenomenon, and you can actually see YouTube videos of her. Get this, while she was dead, she received a vision and an ordination to start a healing ministry. She witnessed Jesus Christ calling her back into life and said, you will go out and you will heal the multitudes in my name, which she did. And it spread across the world. So there's YouTube videos of her laying her hands on her congregation. And you can read extraordinary accounts of spontaneous remission from those who were healed by her faith. But look, if you're looking for a pill or a protocol that will dissolve all your problems, then you're looking in the wrong spot. You're looking out here in the world. Where's the healer? Where's the protocol? Where's the, where's the this? Where's the that? What's the next yogic modality I need? What's the next book I need to read? What's the next religious path to try? If you're looking for something out here, you're looking in the world of form. You're looking in what's already being created. The power of your faith is in your willingness to make an agreement with a new possibility that hasn't yet come into form. And therefore a new possibility that defies what you already know to be real. And your faith requires you to let it be so, even though what you can see is that it is not. It's by your faith that you're healed. We know the story of the woman who touched Jesus's garments. This is Mark 5, 21 to 34. It goes like this. A certain woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and had suffered many modalities, many physicians, she'd spent all her money and she wasn't getting better, she was getting worse. When she heard of Jesus, she passed through the throngs of people and she touched his garment. And she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be whole again. And straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she had been healed. And Jesus said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole. I believe it and I let it be so. Now go in peace and be whole. So how do you develop an embodied faith? a spiritual authority that has the power to instantaneously activate the manifestation of a new reality? How do you cultivate such a purity of spiritual authority that your consciousness can command the spirit to move the substance, turn water into wine? You know, the human journey is about remembering and embodying the knowing of Trinity, right? the knowing of source and spirit and substance. That's the human journey is to what extent can I know this? And maybe your triangle is quite little or maybe your triangle is rather big. And the process of, of coming to that full embodied knowing, that is a unique process, a process that's unique to each one and it's natural discovery. In the 1980s, the consciousness researcher called David Hawkins developed a map of consciousness, and it was calibrated and reviewed by thousands of scientists using applied kinesiology. So this followed the scientific process, and they discovered that we can kind of arrange our proximity to truth on a scale of imaginary units where zero is 100% false, which means there is no trinity, it's all just an accident at the very bottom, and the thousand 
is 100% true, which is a complete embodied knowing that I am that I am. And according to the research, they found that 200 is the level of neutrality. So if you live, if your consciousness is at a level of neutrality, then your attitude towards life is sort of like, meh, you win some, you lose some, who knows? I guess the sun will rise tomorrow, probably, maybe. And anything below 200 is what we would call negative. And by the law of attraction that calls adamantine particles unto each other by resonance, means that any time we dwell in negativity, we magnetize more thought fields and energy fields that are like that. And the effect is entropy, spiritual entropy, decline, depression. And any time we spend above 200 is positivity. And by the law of attraction, we call unto ourselves thought fields and energy fields and experiences that are like that. And the effect is ascension. So spiritual entropy leads towards spiritual death, which is 100% falsehood. And ascension leads towards spiritual enlightenment, towards truth. According to their research, there is only one character in the history of human incarnations who is ever calibrated at 1,000. Can you guess? Put it, in the, put it in the chat if you think you know who that one character was who was fully incarnate as a human and as divine, 100% knowing I am that I am. Who is it? Put it in the chat. We have one vote. Are there any advances? We've got another one. Yep, yep, bring it, bring it, say his name, say his name, Jesus. Christ means anointed knowing. So my man, Jesus, that's right. That is right. And that's got nothing to do with religion. We're talking about consciousness. Look, if you have absolutely nothing in that diamond that would limit the awesome power of God and you are fully knowing that you are source and substance and spirit, then there is nothing limiting your ability to lovingly command the spirit to shift the substance. You can dip your hand into a vial of water and you can bring up wine. So in other words, if there was a consciousness that had no um, creative declarations within this prism other than thy will be done, then you would have a perfect flow of essence through this consciousness. And this energy field would be pure. It would be a pure expression of love. It would be mercy into the field of what is created. So according to David Hawkins and his his troop of researchers, and, and by the way, this experiment has been recreated multiple times in the decade since. At around 490, we have the realm of genius. Genius has got nothing to do with your IQ. It's got everything to do with your ability to know what you need to know in the moment. That's what that is. At the level 500, here we have love and joy. And incidentally, we also have a cat's purr. So a wagging tail of a dog or a cat's purr also calibrates at 500. So if you're ever feeling down in the dumps and you'd like the energy transference to elevate your consciousness, to ascend your consciousness, then grab hold of a sweet little cat and give it a tickle and just feel the purr, feel the purr attuning your cellular consciousness. 
Now, most of the people who are drawn to the sovereign teachings abide somewhere between 300, which is system, 490, which is genius, and 500 and up to 400, 540. That means that usually what we're working on is transcending our addiction to system because underneath 500, every one of these realms of consciousness requires system to work. And above 500, grace works. So system underneath 500 and grace above 500 like that. Now remember, because we're constantly creating what we believe, in other words, as we go through the experience of clearing up what's going on in our conscious mind, our vibe, the quality of our vibrational experience improves. So that's what ascension is. So when Kat is explaining that she doesn't just need to use sovereign to deal with obstacles anymore because there aren't really very many obstacles, it's because the quality of her vibrational reality has improved. So the experience of gaining wisdom over time is the same as coming into a deeper knowing of oneself as I am that I am. It's becoming more like Jesus. It's becoming more like God. But remember, we are constantly living in what has already been created. So we're continuously vulnerable to remaking agreement with old configurations of adamantine particles. Someone walks in wearing ax for men. And for some reason, now I'm angry again. And not only that, but the inner agency for ascension, the call of God upward, is not the only energy that we're dealing with. This is where things get dark. <laughs> the call of God is not the only energy in the universe. Inherent in the universe is a natural counterforce. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If we look at Genesis three, it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any of the animals on the earth. There are two things I want you to notice about that. Number one, the frequency of evil is subtle and crafty. It's an energy. It's not a manifest creation. It's a subtle, subtle frequency. And the second thing I want you to notice about that is that it was already in the garden. It was not the fall of humanity or the separation of God that created it. It is an inherent part of the design. So do not be fooled into thinking that the experience of counterforce has anything to do with your flaws or your lack of spiritual mastery or someone else's lack of spiritual mastery. Don't be fooled into thinking that this counterforce is because of the fall of man or because of separation from God or because of fear. Those things are an effect of a natural counterforce. So that means that your intention to go deeper into God is also met with a metaphysical intention to keep you from doing so. So while you are constantly fighting against recreating what is seen and manifest in your life, you're also opposing an unseen force that is subtle, and sneaky and matches your intelligence and is aware of how you operate and what you're trying to accomplish. That's why for all our striving, we struggle to transcend those patterns of our creation. Here we are living in the patterns of our creation. Look at how Israel fared throughout the Old Testament. They had in their possession 
the metaphysical laws of creation. They knew how to play by the rules of the universe, but they couldn't overcome their collective agreement with persecution, conquest, struggle for power, enslavement and division. Do you see any of that out there in society right now? Do you see this same struggle ongoing, even though we consider ourselves so enlightened? Do you see yourself recreating these patterns, even though you've already come to your awakening and you've already chosen to be the light? You see, even in your conscious ascended awareness, you remain exposed to the dynamics of instant experience. You remain vulnerable to a creative power that won't stop working just because you've had a bad day. No wonder they call it the wrath of God. It's got nothing to do with God's emotions. It's got to do with how you're creating. And this is God too, remember, all things are. In 2017, my family lost everything very quickly. We'd been serving in ministry for four years already. We knew that everything is energy. We knew we have the power of mind over matter. And we were especially focused on manifesting wealth. We, we poured our visioning and our creative manifestation into money making. And we decided that we were ready for anything God would send. We would take any leap and we would trust God whatever came our way. So first, our car was totaled by a city bus. And then Hurricane Irma came through our town. And even though our house was actually safe, we lost all of our contracts and our employment and we could no longer afford to keep our house. So we put it on the market. We gave everything that we owned. Uh, away and we went to Colorado to create a, a thriving chocolate business in the mountains because we can manifest anything right God will provide what we need to, to satisfy our egoic desires and vain visions that are not based on truth but are based on erroneous ideas of what is possible and what is required here's what happened we made the most gorgeous chocolates you can imagine. We infused them with Reiki and with essential oils. They were like little healing bites and they were so, so good. Everybody loved them. But while we had the perfect process for creating the chocolates, we didn't have the perfect process for managing the logistics of what was required for workability out there in the 3D world. And a few months after we, we, we started the business and tried try to, to launch it, even though we were selling some, we gave away thousands of dollars of chocolates at various charity events. And on the surface of things, it looked like it was going really well. We were at the, we were at the governor's mansion giving away chocolates. We attended chocolate festivals. In the meantime, the person whose house we were staying in had a spiritual epiphany and decided that he would follow in our footsteps and give up everything that he had. So he sold his house and we had one week to get out. We hadn't built any wealth at all. We hadn't managed to build any wealth. We, we hadn't figured out how to create chocolates and deliver them for less than 20 bucks a bar. It, was, it just wasn't workable. So immediately you had to look around for a solution because with no credit and with no cash in Colorado, we didn't know how to survive. So we found, we found someone who was willing to give us a, a derelict RV and we tried to do it up. It had bullet holes in it, it had, it had rat's nests in it. And we thought, well, we can, we can pull ourselves together and we can do this and we can create a home out of this. And my, my beautiful, amazing husband worked so hard to try and turn this thing into a home. And I hitchhiked from Colorado to Utah Talk about radical faith. I hitchhiked from one state to another to go to an essential oil conference with Young Living to learn how to make a living out of representing these essential oils that had made such incredible chocolates. And so I left him there with, with the, this RV to do up and with two children to take care of. And I just left him there to, to, to bring a home, to, to bring a home, a house out of nothing. 
And on the last day of the convention, he called me up and he said, it's over. He had peeled back layer after layer. And every time he peeled back a layer, he saw something even worse. It was Pandora's box. And at the end of it, we were nothing but an engine and a platform because all the walls had had to come off and all the, it had been completely gutted. And a friend of ours said, well, for $500, you can lay a floor and I'll, I'll sponsor some of the building materials and you can create a tiny home on top of that. But $500 was so far out of our concept. We, we couldn't even conceive of how are we gonna find $500 to create the floor for this? We couldn't even find 500 bucks to create a house for our children. So if we looked around, we had nothing left. We didn't know what to do. And a friend of ours said, well, I've got a barn. So that's when we moved into this derelict barn. Again, we did what we could to clean it up. There were rats' nests, there were snakes' nests. My, my husband vacuumed the snakes' nest with a shop vac. You know, we, we, we dusted it, the cobwebs and all of that, but this structure was so flimsy and so poor that the windows were broken and they would rattle every time a storm came through. And I tell you what, it was on the side of a mountain with mountains all around like a basin. So every time there was a storm, there wasn't just thunder up ahead, it was all around us. It was, we were in the belly of the monster. And our two little tiny children, aged six and two, were wrapped up in these blankets at night, staying warm as Colorado went into fall and the temperatures plummeted. We managed to start our essential oil business. I managed to earn 50 to 100 dollars a month and that was enough to fill the water so we had some water to drink but we didn't have running water in the barn we had to do our business in the woods we had to wait until it rained before we could wash in the streams we washed our children's hair in the streams we found a little local church called saint lawrence and the pastor there was called nancy malloy and they took us in they gave us a garden plot and they taught us how to grow and all the while, every night we would come home and we had this blue Toyota, was it my love? A blue Toyota that was literally the door was gaffer taped onto it. And when we rent, when we drove along, it would go like that. <laughs> and all the while, despite these extreme ex uh, circumstances with the where we could hear the bears scavenging outside at night and, and we could hear the, the, um, the, the mountain lions snuffing in the nighttime. And we knew that we were literally at the mercy of nature. All the while, we nurtured the essence of home. We sat together and chanted and meditated together around like single candles and a string of fairy lights in order to keep our um, spiritual essence buoyant. So it worked because we did hold on to that knowing of essence, the, the knowing of hope, the knowing of the, the, um, the omnipresence of grace. And so in holding on to that and not making agreement with a cultural idea that we needed to put the children into factory school, um, get minimum wage jobs, apply for Section 8 housing and, and earn our way back into financial stability the traditional way. We didn't make agreement with that. We held on to the knowing that something could be possible, that something could emerge. And that was when that miracle I told you about at the beginning occurred, that someone offered us a luxury mountain cabin on 180 acres where we could stay for almost a whole year nearly rent free as well and by that time my little tiny essential oils business was was earning enough to put some money towards that rent every single month i was teaching some classes i was uh, i was teaching light workers how to heal i was i was teaching reiki i was teaching the beginnings of the sovereign way but we couldn't generate any cash we we, we never made enough to build enough to get back into the system. The system that we had declared we didn't need, but we'd said God will provide. And remember how I said, you create according to what you believe. Be careful, 
be careful what you wish for. Because there we were, seven months into staying in this cabin, and she calls and says, I'm going to need it back because I'm coming back for the summer. So once again, we were standing at that same precipice. Are we going to be homeless again? We don't know what to do. We don't have anything to do. Remember I told you that we put the house in Florida on the market? It hadn't sold. It hadn't sold at all. For some reason, it hadn't sold and it hadn't gone into foreclosure. But it wasn't anywhere near our consciousness that we could go back. It was under offer and then the offer would fall through. It was under offer. That, and the debt was mounting up. The debt was now becoming uh, just unmanageable. We were now... Uh, Oh my word, it was getting close to $100,000 in bad debt. So we, we blocked that out of our mind. Don't even think about it. We can't even approach it. It's a beast that's too big to even consider trying to take down. And all we've got is this little slingshot. And that Goliath is way too big. So a woman that had been following us on Instagram reached out and said, you can come and stay on our land for a little while. And she was a pagan priestess. She was, was laser focused on earth-based devotion. And she said, come to the land. I've been calling for a family who can come and help us raise a bathhouse out of the earth using adobe and cob. And we didn't have any other option. And actually, wasn't this something that we had talked about many years ago about how cool it would be to live on the land? We bought a canvas tent the people at our church rallied around and they gave us solar powered um, showers and they gave us tin openers and cans of food. And we actually meticulously mapped out what we did have and what we did know. So this is us for the first time, not trying to bypass what is, but actually sinking into what is and looking at the lay of the land, really creating a landscape of what is actually known in this moment. And we took everything we had and we moved out into the wilderness. We went further into the Rocky Mountains, out into the high desert in Delta County, where we pitched up our tent on the land of these beautiful people. We stayed there for a long time. And I studied with her in the ways of devotion. I studied with her in the ways of, of slow magic or in the ways of, of meticulous precision and excellence. And I learned from her the importance of truly cultivating the essence of home. Now she was brutal. She was brutal because she had an eye for truth and she would stand for nothing but. And at the same time, my husband, Matt, was was working with the man of the land, with the lord of the land, and stripping juniper trees. And we had to pickaxe the rock to level the land so that the tent would be pitched upright. There was this one time when I went to bed and there were so many ticks and fleas and flies and bugs, and they were biting all around my ears and those sores were opening up and they were weeping. And because the floor, uh, the, because the land that we were pitched on was not straight or stable, all the blood would rush down into my head and I would wake up with it throbbing, throbbing. And I had to get up in the morning and it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And I had to pickaxe the land in order to lay, to, to, to level it so that it I wouldn't be in such excruciating the pain the next day. And what I did to make it bearable was put on my prettiest pink hat and my lovely flowery dress because it was the only way that I could keep from crying was to bring some beauty into the situation, was to stand there underneath the Milky Way galaxy as it went across and listening to the sound of the coyotes as they yapped across the mountains, to be there in my pink dress holding that pickaxe and knowing that if I can do nothing, at least I can make the land for our tent a little bit more level. And my husband slept with a big knife at his side every single night, just in case one of the bears came in through the tent to sample one of my juicy and delicious children. Gotta make light of these things. 
there was a bear attack on the camp. They drank both my bottles of thieves laundry soap. Woke up in the morning, <laughs> there's no laundry soap left. We had, a, we had a big tub to wash our clothes in. And I had my, my thieves laundry soap from Young Living. It really is the best laundry soap you can get. And, um, and, and so, but I, I left it out. I didn't know that bears like that stuff. And in the morning they're being torn up. I love the idea that somewhere up the stream was a really frothy mouthed bear smelling amazing. <laughs> I love that idea. Those were the circumstances that we were living in. It was real. It was hard. Perhaps you've never lived in a tent in the wild. Perhaps you've never been homeless. Perhaps your children have never been at the immediate risk of being eaten by wild animals. But do you know what real hardship is? Have you felt the pain of not knowing what to do? Have you looked around and gone, there are no options left? Yes, you have. You know exactly what I was feeling in those moments. Suddenly the call came a little bit later and we heard that my, my grandmother had died in England. And so my husband held me really close and he said, it's time to go home. Back to that essence of home. And so even though we'd been cultivating this, this new lifestyle and attempting to create for ourselves a way of living that meant we weren't at the mercy of, of structural shifts and economical fluctuations, we decided once again to give it all up and make a new agreement. We went to England and there shortly after, my mum was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. She was a skeleton. She was completely void, she wasn't present. There was so much darkness. There was so much weight. There was nothing shining away, but that mustard seed sized grain of faith. And a, a piece of paper came in saying, you have Alzheimer's. And that mustard seed sized grain of faith was enough for us to say, hang on, we don't have to make agreement with this. Something new could come to form. Just like how a mansion could manifest when all you've got is a barn. Perhaps extraordinary healing can manifest when all you've got is the promise of a slow and agonizing death. So we sat down and we began the energy work. This is the energy work that we teach in the Sovereign Way. Remember I said we teach a lifestyle of focused thought and energy work. And we began a really powerful technique for releasing. We, we, we enlisted the help of several other professionals and we created an agreement between us and others that something new could come to form. And we decided to move back to Sarasota, to the house that still hadn't sold. Now we were like, ping, an idea just dropped into our mind. What about that house in Florida that still hasn't sold? The house that we now are so deeply in debt with that we are literally a hair width away from, from well, it doesn't belong to us anyway, it belongs to the, to the bank. But we knew that we could arrive back there like a skipping stone and at least we could arrive there and see what would happen next. So we did, we packed up our suitcases, our children, my mum, and we landed here at this house with $100 and nothing else. The bad debt was so devastatingly enormous, there was nothing we could do to service it. And the rules are that, uh, that um, if you have a back debt on your mortgage, you can't service your mortgage until you've paid off that back debt. So we did everything that we could to work with the mortgage company. And all they ever said was find the hundred thousand and then we can talk. Meanwhile, 
my mother was steadily coming back to life. The work we were doing was steadily bringing her essence out of the void and back into presence. That's not supposed to be possible. That's not allowed. Suddenly she's here again. Suddenly she's looking forward to tomorrow. Suddenly she's singing and dancing and wondering and actually recalling. She's beginning to remember. We actually went to an Alzheimer's support group to tell the story that, of what was happening here and they didn't believe it. They kicked us out because it defied the agreement that they had made about what was possible. They couldn't come into agreement with an idea of an impossibility coming true. So there we are again. Now we're back in, now we're, now we're in Florida in the same house we left when the hurricane came. We can't service it. We're at the risk of foreclosure. It's going to happen any minute now. And do you notice the pattern here? Do you notice that there's a pattern recreating? Is, is Israel amazing rise and ascension and then a plummet and a crash? Back again at the threshold, creating that devastation once more. Now we're going to be homeless again for the third time. This time, this time we gave up. This time we looked at the systems that we had been recreating and we realized it is too complicated. We practice our mastery. We know our Reiki. We're doing our healing. We're doing our thought techniques. We're writing our vision boards. We're doing everything that we know how to do, but we cannot clear whatever it is that's so complicated in here in subconscious mind that keeps recreating this excruciating problem. We weren't babies on the path of enlightenment. We'd been doing this stuff for years and years and years. But we could not overcome this system of recreation. Here's where we'd been going wrong. This is the human consciousness. And these green spots here are all the agreements that you've made. And there's trillions of them. It's impossible to count. These are all those limbic associations. These are all the, 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 the acts for men, the thing that Stacy said in third grade, <clears throat> your idea that there's nobody here who understands you, whatever it is that you're recreating. And this is the energy field that carries the complicated stamp of all that. And look, some of these things aren't even yours. You've inherited them. You've picked them up culturally. In whatever way, you've made an agreement with these subconscious paradigms and beliefs, and they are so intricate and complex that you cannot clear them on your own. It's like trying to peel every layer of a never-ending onion. And so what we would been doing is we'd been trying to peel this onion. We'd been trying to be so masterful to take accountability and responsibility for creating the life that we wanted to see. Now see here that inherent in, remember how we all made possible that all made agreement that all things are possible in God. We all did that. Every one of us, we all, we said yes to that. Well, inherent therefore, in that field of possibility is the possibility of a perfect framework of consciousness. One that's just like yours, except it is 100% knowing that I am that I am. In fact, the Christ event that happened 2000 years ago, when God made the executive decision to incarnate, to pierce space and time and incarnate as a fully realized human being in Jesus Christ, that created a precedent, a precedent for human consciousness that is now available 
to all human beings by agreement. And because that's available in the, in the nature of all things, you are always entangled with that possibility. And your mastery, as you go through life and you experience increasing wisdom, your mastery in cleaning up what's going on in your subconscious mind brings you into closer proximity with that truth. It brings you into closer proximity with that thousand on this imaginary scale. And look here, as the energy, as creative essence pours through this pure consciousness, the energy that emits from it is 100% pure love. Pure love, when it is applied to what is already created is what's called mercy. And so that means that grace is manifested in quantum form that adamantine particles that are commanded by the knowing and the power of love are, are, are created in perfect form, which means that an, however, whatever your proximity is to that pure consciousness dictates the extent to which your life is manifested in grace. That's why things get easier as you get closer to truth. That's why things get easier as you ascend, because there is a greater field of your life that is manifested in grace. Mercy applied to what is already form, right? So here you are creating your, your rubbish, recreating those patterns. But when those patterns come into contact with grace, they're neutralized. Where we'd been going wrong was actually seeing Jesus as a role model, as a brother, an ascended master, someone who had done it before us, someone to emulate, someone to, to copy, someone to be like, what would Jesus do? Let me do that. And we were trying to copycat an idea that we had of what pure consciousness must be like even though that is so far out of our conception, so far out of the spiritual archives of our mind, that there's no way we can recreate a resonance with that on our own. That was where we'd been going wrong. There's an easier way. There's a better way. You see, it is very possible, here you go, Instead of walking with Jesus, you can walk in Jesus. Instead of by your works, by your ascending mastery, attempting to neutralize all the ancestral wounds and overcome all the karma and steadily become a little bit more like that conceptual idea you have of what pure truth must be. And in doing so, enlarging the amount of your life that is affected by grace, by the energetic transference, you can choose to align your consciousness so that instead of walking with Jesus, you are walking in Jesus. That switch of consciousness to say, I place this intercessory field of consciousness, this framework above my own. So that this way of knowing is Lord over my way of knowing. Now, that infinitely powerful wrath of God, incessantly creating spirit that is always taking form, whether you have a bad day or not, is softened by this perfect, pure framework of consciousness before it actually gets anywhere near yours. You're bathed in mercy. Now, you might not reach perfection immediately, but you've been delivered from the incessant experience of recreating what you already know. In this configuration, the 
infinitely creating power of spirit is softened by the intercessory field before it meets yours. And you're creating inside a field of mercy, which means not some of your life is graced, but all of your life is graced. You see the difference? That's why he's the savior. Because that precedent in consciousness exists for you. And it delivers you out of an incessantly creating, recreating pattern. Now, the other cool thing is, remember, we create as we believe, right? We agree that we create as we believe. So if you believe that he's a savior, then what happens when you drift off, as you are wont to do in your humanity, Along comes that subtle serpent in Walmart, next to the man with the bananas and the ax for men. And you smell the ax for men and you go into your feedback system and the serpent's right there, making up some, making up some nonsense. Well, what happens if you have a savior and you've wandered off? He brings you back. You're not left to your own devices. You don't trigger the entropy. You don't trigger that downward spiral of entropy anymore because he brings you back. The shepherd who goes looking for the sheep and you are brought back once again into the body of grace. So where we had been going wrong all that time was in thinking of Jesus Christ as a role model and a master and a brother. And it wasn't until we clicked that he could be our Lord and savior. So an idea that had been so triggering for so long, Lord, Lord, savior, who do I need saving from? I don't need saving, I'm an independent badass woman totally triggered by these ideas. But until we figured it out, until it made sense in consciousness, we couldn't allow that. Here's what happened next. What happened next was this. We said, Jesus, you be our Lord and savior. You do the thing. Up call someone on the phone saying, we represent a third party housing uh, people and we have a big grant from the government and we are able to make your whole debt go away. If you've, been, if you've been affected by natural disaster and business failure, have you? Yes? All right, well, in that case, all you have to do is fill in these forms, follow the process, do the thing, expand yourself, step out into the unknown, be willing to try something completely different. And if you are, if you're willing to show up, in that extraordinary way, then the debt is gone. And we really did have to show up in an extraordinary way. We had to do things we'd never done before. We had to, we had to manifest um, business deals and money and cash and to prove that we were able to steward a new way of being, to prove that we were able to come back into the system that we had left in such a violent fashion before. And as of the 27th of January, 2022, the debt is completely wiped. And the house is ours again. And we're home in a house. And structure and essence have been united. And the pattern has been broken forever. And the switch we made was going from walking with Jesus to walking in Jesus. A complete shift in consciousness and a deliverance. We only have a few minutes left, my darlings, but if you thought that story was powerful, if you felt that that story was powerful, give me an emoji or something in the chat. Show me that you received 
the idea of deliverance, the possibility of power. Show me that you agree that whatever, however crazy and unimaginable the agony and the hardship is, that it can be delivered, you can be renewed, you can be completely forgiven, and that you can be bathed in mercy through and through, in form, in vibration, and in consciousness. Jesus, do the thing. Do what you're known to do. And you see, here's the really cool thing, right? I don't have a fully embodied knowing of myself as source and substance and spirit. I get it conceptually. I agree with it. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm not living that. But I don't have to anymore. It means that if I need something to occur, if I need miraculous deliverance from something that I can't sort out on my own, and let's say it costs a thousand dollars to get that sorted, and I've only got six hundred and forty dollars to get that sorted, right? Looking at our scale again here. Let's say it costs a thousand to get that sorted, and I've only got six hundred and twenty. In Jesus, He gives you the rest. He makes up in the deficit for your mastery. And it's not alone. It's a gift. That is the power of deliverance. And all it takes is your agreement. That means suspending your disbelief. It means putting away all your triggers. It means getting that this isn't about religion. This isn't about the church. It isn't about whose team are you on. Are you going to be a kundalini yogi or are you going to be a Christian? It's not about that. It's about consciousness. It's about alignment. It's about your choice to walk inside an infinite field of grace that knows you and loves you and wants to be there for you. We have a few minutes left. Thank you so much for all of that love that you've sent through here. Thank you for agreeing. It can be done, it will be done, and it is done. Beautiful words, Tina. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for, 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 for being present and participating. I want to open up to two more really special people before we, before we part. I'm going to keep the doors open for a little bit. Uh, even after we pass that eight o'clock mark, I'm going to keep the doors open, and you can bring your questions. We can do some group coaching. If you need to shoot off, that's fine as well. But before we go, I want to introduce you to Maria. Maria has been a student with the Sovereign Way for three years and has demonstrated an incredible release and surrender and, and has remarkably gone on an, a journey so strangely close to ours actually but the beauty that Maria brings is that she's doing it with this realization and the experience for her is completely different than it was for us so Maria if I have you I'd like to ask you to unmute and to come on and share some words about what you've discovered. You have me, Elizabeth, and you, we also have Milu. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. You're on fire tonight. It's been like mind-blowing sitting here, even after three years walking with you. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, to go back to, to life before you, <laughs> before Sovereign. And um, I, I spent most of my life uh, in, in a, a really destructive relationship with myself, actually. Uh, I've been um, abusing and, and misusing lots and lots of stuff that, that uh, can be really joyful if you're in a different mindset. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, adventuring, uh, but, but it never really got me anywhere. Uh, I've been looking, I've been searching, I've been, I've been trying to find something. And I've been saying yes, I've been saying yes to adventures. I've been saying yes to, to that little impulse of yeah move there do that be with them uh, and uh, well yeah it, it it got me to to 
severe uh, chronic illness uh, eventually, uh, that adventuring. And, uh, and that was my death. That was a much needed death. Uh, but a brutal one, and uh, and I didn't have the sovereign framework at that time. Uh, it was uh, it would have been different, uh, of course. I know that now, but but I didn't, and I, I found a way through and out of that, anyways. But uh, a few years into my rebirth, into my um, my new becoming. Uh, and and then the the afterlife, I was still struggling. Uh, I was still finding myself. Now that you have introduced us all to these models, I was still finding myself trapped in that loop uh, because I had programs still that told me um, falsehood, uh, and 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 I was I was suffering. And I, I remember the day when I walked up the mountain. <laughs> uh, I was I was voice messaging Elizabeth, and I, I think I actually cried uh, while I, I was speaking to you because I was in despair. I I just didn't know what to do uh, with anything, and uh, and I enrolled in the adventurer program. <laughs> And, and now, about two years later, I'm in Portugal in a tent, <laughs> living a, a, a true adventure. But the thing is that what was the big shift is, is that now when I say yes to adventure, now that I, that I, I lean into these, uh, these things that, that, that seem joyful and, and and tempting, I do, I, I say that yes, from a different place in me. I say that yes, with a different knowing. And that completely shifts everything. I am no longer searching for something out there. I am adventuring because of fun of it. Uh, I, have, I have nothing to find out there uh, in that way. And that is what the sovereign way uh, has done for me. Uh, it is the framework that that allows me to 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 be free, uh, to be sovereign, and and to to understand to understand more of me, and and that model of uh, of uh, human consciousness uh, that that is like that is my visual for remembering, that is my visual for for like. Because yeah, I forget, I forget who I am, uh, and 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 to to remember that and to to bring myself back into a hey, yeah right, what's going on here, yeah what 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 is what is the framework for my knowing now, and and go back to that, that is that is the game changer, uh, so so and yeah of course. Um, life in a tent with a three-year-old isn't always really really easy uh, especially when you're up doing zoom calls in the middle of the night um, but but i am i am in in more balance in the in the everyday life also even though yes as i said i sometimes forget but it's easy to find the way back. I have something to go back to. I have something to, to stand on that is firm and solid. And, uh, and that brings me much joy and peace in the experience of, of life. I can, I can look at the, the challenges that comes with, almost with a smile sometimes. And I'm like, yeah, well, okay, let's see. Let's see what this is. Let's see what this is now. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna keep, keep adventuring and actually enjoy life now when I am in a more healthy and balanced relationship with myself. And I found my way back to God. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, 
I, I, I think I, I had that when I was a child uh, and, uh, and nothing I ever tried has brought me this close to God. I, I've been dipping my toes in different spiritual teachings and, and yeah, different ways. But, but actually, and, and, and I've been studying the sovereign way in, in the same time as I was attending a, a, a shamanistic uh, uh, wheel of the year circle with, with, with diving deep into that practice and, and the sovereign way flows naturally in and through and around everything. I, I can understand I can understand the world differently and more deeply uh, through the sovereign framework. And that is, that is liberating. That is liberating. Yeah, so I, I'm forever grateful. Yeah, and now Milo needs to drink some water all of a sudden. But <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for everyone on this, on this call. It's been an amazing night, amazing. Thanks for all the energy that you bring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for sharing your story. You said some gorgeous things there, one of which is now there is a solid foundation on which to really truly enjoy life, that you can continue adventuring and creating in your mastery on that foundation. That's the foundation through which we find our way back to God, as you said. Stunning testimony, thank you so much. We all know what it's like to, to be out there looking and seeking, to feeling that darkness. And, and sometimes even if we've made agreement with the idea of a savior, we're not actually living in it. We're not actually being inside that body. So the ultimate gift is to be able to maintain this position in consciousness while also pursuing the path of ascension and the deepening intimacy with the one who is opening to you so deeply to be both surrendered and masterful, allowing and creating. And it was during my time in the desert that I wrote The Sovereign Way. It's a deeply hopeful path, laced with humor and genius and magic, soaked in the presence of grace. The teachings may be laser focused on the metaphysical mechanics of ascension, which we say is the unfolding of your life, and the natural deepening of this intimacy, this personal intimacy with God. And we teach the way of life that includes energy work. It includes focused applied thought, magic and genius. It includes personal prayer and constant surrendered forgiveness, the resulting life of purpose and devotion. Right now, wherever you are, however you're feeling, sitting, standing, lying, if you like the idea and you want to make agreement with getting to know that one more intimately and aligning your framework underneath one that has been precedented for you, then put your hands together and sink into the seat and say, Yes, I agree in the possibility of being delivered. I agree with the reality of an alignment with Jesus Christ. I will have you as my Lord. I will have you as my savior. And this means nothing to my religion, but it means everything to my life. I choose you. And from this moment on, I am held in your tender embrace. In Jesus' name, amen. Good. Type Amen in the chat. We are a new ministry. 
and we're taking steps now to establish ecclesiastical authority and our purpose, our specific purpose, something that sets us aside from traditional Christian churches is that we are promoting the education and development of the higher spiritual gifts. We are raising miracle workers, we are raising healers, we are raising ascended masters, and we are anchoring in the promise that the heaven is here, that the Garden of Eden is here, and that we needn't wait for a hereafter to see the promised land. So we welcome you to join our Monday services, our Wednesday discussions, Thursday life coaching, and Friday ascension training. Hallelujah, Saver says, hallelujah, it is here. And to help our ministry promote this education and training, we ask that you consider becoming a monthly supporter, a member of our community, at whatever level of giving is right for you. So we've created some guiding tiers, but there's no expectation these teachings are free, these teachings are for you. But for a, in order for us to do this, we ask that you consider giving back in some way. So Matt is going to place the link that we have. Um, he's gonna place that in the chat now. And then I ask for you to click on that link and open that page and consider which of these tiers are appropriate for you to support this growing ministry, this growing movement of Christ-based ascension teachings to anchor in that new world and to, to, to allow us to not just be saved and delivered, but to be saved and delivered and growing. A child of God is a manifestation of source, spirit, and substance. You are love. That is your name. And you are knowing that you are love. And you have great magnetic spiritual authority to shift the particles of creation and allow a new thing to be known. To glorify the Father through the Son is to be a demonstration of that infinite truth that there is but one God, the Trinity. Source, spirit, and substance in one. Jesus Christ knew this. He was the manifestation of God, 100% love in human form. And he said, in a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And because I live, you will live also. And on that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's John 14, 19 to 20. Thank you for joining Deliverance. Thank you for supporting everybody on the call here. Thank you for making agreement with the new thing. Thank you for being delivered, for receiving by participation the transmission of truth for considering to support our ministry further and for praying for one another in love and in thanksgiving for the omnipresence of renewal. Have a beautiful and blessed weekend. If you need to leave, goodbye and good night and blessings. And if you'd like to stay for questions and communion, you are very welcome.